thank you all for all of the work that you do. Uh, it's a privilege to come to explain some of my research without getting too researchy. Um, uh, over the last couple of years. Does anybody know what this number is? What it represents? So that's almost it. It's worldwide. So uh, in the United States, it's about $600 billion a year. Worldwide, it's uh, $4.625 trillion. Where did that number come from? That's a number that was given out in 2014. And it was a number provided by Rob Hutter, who is the CEO of Learn Capital. So just to get your perspective on the price that has been put on the head of education globally. That is, it's around $5 trillion now. Um, and that was presented at the uh, sixth conference of the International Finance Corporation, which is the private arm of the World Bank. And they run a biannual uh, privatization and education conference. And by the way, this conference happened uh, at the, I think, San Francisco Hyatt, with exactly zero protests or anything else happening outside, and you have 500 people inside discussing the best ways to privatize education on an international level throughout Latin America, uh, across the world. So that, that just, so a lot of times I talk to people and they feel like they're um, experiencing something in their school district that's very unique to their district. And this is not unique. It's not um, limited to a particular context. But it uh, does have some long-standing roots. So I, I really appreciated Carlos going before, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build on some of the comments that he talked about. So basically, today I want to talk about how we got here, what, what works in different countries or doesn't. And then we're just asking this question of do market-based or governments provide the best education. So how do we get here? Um, in the 1970s, uh, and this is a picture of Augusto Pinochet meet, milt, meeting with Milton Friedman. Um, Milton is the guy in the middle on the dark suit um, on the couch having a very slacks and economics conference on uh, what they're going to do with the Chilean economy after Pinochet took over. Uh, from Allende in a military coup. And I just have to mention, actually, that uh, there's these little features of history that are interesting. Allende declared in 1971 uh, that the, it was the year of education in Chile, and then he was deposed in 1973. So there was this strong focus that I think gets lost on education and democracy that was happening in Chile before the coup. Anyway, in 1973, there's a coup. By 1980, um, Chile has uh, done a national voucher scheme uh, in education. And meanwhile, across the world in Finland, uh, there is a country that is uh, pursuing equity in education. Now, notice I didn't say high performance. I said equity, right? So in the 1970s, Finland said we want to have a democratic welfare state that's based on equity, and we want to have every kid have access to a high-quality education. Well, what happened? So in 2011, we saw the third wave of protest over a decade in Chile, and I mean real protests, tanks, water cannons, like real, actual, in the streets, about education too, which you rarely find uh, in this planet where we, people are willing to go to the streets about education. But they are, it was a social movement in Chile based on the inequitable uh, realities of the education system after 30 years of a voucher system, right? and then. In Finland, uh, I don't know, most folks in education know that Finland became the uh, global success story in 2000 when they unexpectedly scored the highest on the international achievement test, a ranking they've maintained over the last 15 years. Um, and so the whole international community descended on Finland to figure out what they had done. So we get into that a little bit. But basically, in the research that I'm doing, we, you know, comparing Finland and Chile and the U.S. doesn't really work because there's not very apples to apples. So we look at Finland and Sweden, and we didn't have to go very far, just across the little uh, water body over there to find out that Sweden had actually privatized their system in the 90s. 
and uh, we'll get to the results of that in a second. We look at Canada and the United States, both decentralized systems with examples of public investment and privatization. Um, we look specifically at some of the privatization examples in the U.S. and Ontario as a public investment model in Canada. And then we look at Cuba and Chile. I already explained about Chile, and I'll talk about Cuba in a second. But basically, what are we talking about here? And I think uh, on the privatization for this, for this uh, particular venue, I think the privatization issue is summarized by Pazi Salberg's analysis. He's a Finnish author who wrote the chapter on Finland in this book that I had referenced earlier, Global Education Reform. And he looks at the market mechanisms of competition and choice, right? So the theory is basically if charter schools compete against each other and, stu and students and parents choose their charter schools, then though low performing or not well serving charter schools will go out of business or, and the parents will then be enrolled magically in high performing charter schools. Well, that's not what happens as I think most people in this room are aware of. And then uh, what happens in the classroom is that you have this focus on uh, assessment, literacy, and numeracy uh, that is because schools are measured on their, um, on their test scores. And then, uh, you know, that's the test-based accountability writ large, so you have uh, a variety of punitive sanctions coming down. We all know the no child left behind school closure model. So when we look at what happened uh, about how these features of the germ, and I think it's an interesting concept, the global education reform movement, um, the germ is beginning in, the, in Pinochet's voucher system. It's enacted in Milwaukee in the uh, voucher system in the United States. And then later we have what uh, Carlos said, the corporate charter school movement here in the 2000s. Uh, in uh, Sweden, Basically, they marketize their entire system so anybody can open a school. And, uh, but we have some antidotes, actually, right? So Finland used an equity-based system, and they, they kind of have an immunity to the germ because they, uh, they have high international test scores. So the business community wanted to change. Uh, they were facing a lot of pressure, the same as Sweden, for the business community to change into a, a, a market-based model. And then in 2000, their test scores are the highest in the world, and that argument lost legitimacy. Um, in Canada, there was actually a, a very important democratic uh, approach that happened with um, voting out uh, the uh, Mike Harris government in the early 2000s based largely on an education platform. Dalton McGuinty came in and reversed the course of education. They had literally put vouchers into legislation but not enacted them yet. So they were on the cusp of well, actually, Ontario is pretty much on the cusp of the United States in 2017, right? We are on, we are talking about national rollout of vouchers right now. So, uh, and they organized democratically to prevent that from happening. Uh, and then Cuba has <laughs> the germ protection, which is also eroding. Uh, they've kind of been sheltered from the, uh, from the impact of the global education reform movement. Um, and I'll, I'll, talk to, I'll talk about them in a second. So briefly, what does this mean uh, in terms of the, um, see, I'm not getting all my, I'm not getting all my uh, countries to show up here. So um, I'll just point out that, uh, I would love this to work. There we go. So um, up at the top, we have, this is the finish line of performance over years. Uh, this is the Canadian line. This is the Swedish line. So Sweden in 2000 was at a 510 on PISA. The average on PISA is 500. And by 2012, they're at 478. So they're below the United States. And I think that is one of the most profound uh, evidence uh, pieces for the failure of a market-based solution to provide equitable and high-quality education. The United States is consistently below the OECD norm, and Chile has improved a little bit, but is far below the other OECD countries. So for a more apples-to-apples -apples comparison in, in uh, Latin America, we look at test scores from um, Latin America, we see Chile, and then we see Cuba at the highest proficiency level, and they're literally in a different field. I mean, they have 100% literacy, Cuba is the envy of Latin America. Uh, they send a lot of their doctors to get trained. People in Latin America go to Cuba to get trained. 
Um, it's an educational success story. Uh, the political life, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, as the author of the chapter of Cuba said that it's great to be a child in Cuba. I'm not sure about being an adult in Cuba. So, I mean, so in any case, um, let's see, what, what am I doing on time? I think we're, we're behind. So I'm going to skip a couple of things here. Um, I'm going to say basically that what we've done with the analysis, you can read about it in the book, but we look at, we basically aggregate all of the different features of education systems. So when we're talking about market-based systems, we're talking about all of these different drivers of privatization, deregulation, efficiency, choice, competition I talked about before, and then how does it happen? Mar vouchers, charter schools, markets, and in the developing world, low-fee private schools. All of these ways are kind of ways to um, change education into a marketplace and to uh, sort of siphon off public money is the end result of these approaches. And then when we look at public investment, we see very different drivers, um, ownership, responsibility, equity, democracy. There's the idea of universal access, preparing citizens. And if I were to take away one takeaway from this entire study across all the countries we looked at, that the preparation of teachers is a focus of high quality education systems. So when you have well-prepared teachers across the board and not just in your wealthiest 20% districts, then you have a high quality education system. So uh, uh, the rest of it is sort of window dressing, but we'll talk about it. So um, I'm gonna briefly, I talked about what happened in Chile I just will say that basically from a, a theoretical perspective, just so you know what's happening, there, the approach is privatization, the rationale is choice, and the mechanism is vouchers. And for those who may not know exactly what a voucher is, a voucher is the state giving a family a, a set sum of money, like $3,000, $6,000, $9,000, which they can take to any school they want. So it's different than a charter school because you can go to religious schools and that's a huge issue in the United States context. It's why the Milwaukee experiment in the 90s didn't actually pick up because uh, there was a, we have a division of church and state which is sort of fundamental to the American experiment and um, that is also on the table right now. We have a, a, a very avowed religious person as a secretary of education who wants to dilute this boundary between the church and state and also the markets and uh, public sector education. So. What happened in Chile? Basically, we see a massive uh, level of displacement of public education. So the private voucher schools are now, they're a higher percentage in the country than public schools. So we're talking about percentages. We're talking about percentages in Oakland. We got like 30, 40% charters. Where is this headed? Um, and what does this mean for these students, right? So when you look at this group, it's a little hard to see, but basically, the highest socioeconomic group here is this tan color. They all go to private schools. Oh, well, and then I guess I, let's see. And then um, the middle high and the middle group are aggregated in the um, voucher schools, right? And then the lower groups are aggregated in the public schools in terms of uh, socioeconomic status. So the OECD is calling it the most segregated education system, and uh, academics are calling it an example of apartheid in education. So it, it, the outcomes of this after 30 years are very clear. So uh, the, there's a whole, they did actually change some things in Chile, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, I'm gonna skip Cuba in the interest of time, um, but I will note there that teacher investment, as we see, they have equal salaries, partially because the state says they're you know, mostly equal in, uh, in terms of they don't have the level of income inequality that we have in the United States. So you can see the embedded layers of the market-based system trickling into all of the social sectors via income inequality um, and other, other ways. So it's a, it's a contrary approach. So when we look at Sweden, I think it's actually, this is important. <laughs> So in 1948, in Sweden, the primary task for the school is to form democratic humans, right? Um, and then in 1970, 
the Prime Minister says that education is a spearhead into the future and the key to abolish class society. And then in 20, 2006, we have the founder of a school company saying to run a school and to sell refrigerators are one and the same. It's about having your ear to the market and to understand where the needs are for our customers to students. That company is out of business in 2014. <laughs> in the middle of the school year, shutting down, and all the Swedish people are like, wait, you can't shut a public institution. Oh, yeah, you can, actually. Because if your public institution is market-based and it's just you're selling a refrigerator, yeah, the Sears just went out of business, except your kids are now without a school. So it, and it was, I think, a shock to the system, and now Sweden's trying to figure out, like, hey, we can't just have thousands of kids without a school in December 9th, you know? It's going to make for a rough holiday. So anyway, that, that's what's happening in, in, in Sweden. And I think this is another important feature of this shift. So before we heard Carlos talk about Schenker talking about the shift, the, the, the role of charter schools as positively influencing the public sector by being sites of innovation that were local. And that was the same thing that happened in Sweden. They had alternative schools where they practiced different pedagogies so you didn't have to roll out at the whole district level and then they use that to inform their system. Well, you fast forward past the 1990s and that influencing model has become a replacement model, right? And I think that's what we're also seeing in this country is the idea that we're gonna replace our public education system, we're gonna disrupt it, and we're going to have a fully charterized system, which we talk about in New Orleans. So now, here's for the kind of really scary part. Um, the way we usually think about Sweden is that they're this, like amazing social welfare state and that this is an atypical moment. But reality, when you extend that perspective, the typical Swedish attributes are this private ownership and private operation. It turns out the welfare state was just a bubble between 1945 and 1990. And it, that's something for us to think about socially, about what, what's at stake here when we talk about the kind of global impact of a neoliberal model over 40 years that reinforces a long-standing history of inequality. Okay, so Finland, we go, we go across the, uh, this gulf here and we look at Finland. We already showed you that they were very high performing. And just to, uh, just to outline, we saw before this competition choice model in the global education reform model. And then when we look at what the Finns do, they collaborate among their schools. They have an equity of outcomes model where they're looking at not just high outcomes, but equity. They're personalized learning. And by personalized learning, I don't mean tablet learning. I mean actually like teachers in a classroom working with students so that they understand their own developmental trajectory, um, but not just putting them in front of a computer for six hours a day. Because that is a very tricky concept in, in the US. Uh, a, and concurrently a focus on the whole child development and then instead of test-based accountability, there's trust-based responsibility. So Finland pays their teachers to get master's degrees before they go into the classroom. Imagine a world in which we had all of our teachers with master's degrees paid by the state with stipends. <laughs> it's not a fiction, it actually happens. It's a, a regulation, they get supported and then what, what do you, then you can trust them. It's not this test-based accountability model where you're thinking that your teachers are always on the verge of failing and if you don't test every student, every subject, uh, then you're gonna not know how your teachers are doing. So it's a very different approach um, and one that they've, they've invested heavily in. So now we're at the United States um, and we look at uh, and I'm glad Massachusetts was discussed a little bit because we look at Milwaukee and New Orleans as sites of vouchers and charter schools and uh, Massachusetts as a, a different way of doing things. Um, basically, as you can see in the United States, we have privatization as the driver choices, the rationale is not vouchers as much as it is charters right now. Um, and then we talk about the United States, the history of the United States, we, we talked about it earlier, but in the 90s, there was kind of not a, a strong political pushback against the privatization or marketization of education through charter schools or vouchers. And now we are at this inflection point 
where we're about to decide a national uh, direction for education. Um, so just briefly on, on Milwaukee, uh, we look at the voucher enrollment and uh, we see an increase in voucher enrollment by students <coughs> over time. And you know, I just show this chart because I wonder if you remember the Chile chart and you see that convergence and what we're thinking about is you know, what does that look like in 10 years? Uh, and then we see that there wasn't a real improvement over the same time period in uh, achievement. So then I'm going to shift actually to New Orleans because I did a two-year case study of New Orleans. And in particular, um, I want to talk about a couple of things in New Orleans, and then I'm going to try to wrap up. Um, so in New Orleans, before Hurricane Katrina, the recovery school district was started. So that was started based on the No Child Left Behind model of school turnaround so that the states could then take over the um, schools, the, the, the low performing schools in New Orleans. And I say that because some people think the recovery school district was a Katrina recovery. It's not a Katrina recovery. It's a recovery from school failure, apparently. Um, but it's a critically important because it was a mechanism that was in place so that when Katrina happened, in 2005, then um, the state of Louisiana was able to fire 7,000 teachers without due process, multiple lawsuits. The, I mean, basically, I think the teachers won, but then if I read it correctly, then somebody else decided, I don't follow all the appeals court, but basically they're like, yeah, but we can't afford the billion dollars of restitution for that, so we're going to say that you don't get paid. So it was, it's a very difficult legal situation. But I think very applicable to this conference of Labor Fest in what can happen to labor under this system. Anyway, the schools are closed. They're reformatted as uh, charter schools. What happened, you have uh, a lot of the charter organizations and chains that Steve mentioned earlier are in play here. There's zero tolerance discipline uh, climate. Um, students are being pushed out of lots of schools, so there's creaming and cropping happening. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and basically student selection is, is happening all the time. There's also charter schools are opening and closing, so that gets them out of the accountability model because you have a three-year window where you're not counted in the accountability model, so then if you change your principal and your name of your school after three years, then you can become out of the accountability model again. I mean, the level of loopholes is truly mind-boggling. Um, so what happens? Basically, we see this performance by years, uh, by, or by, within the 2012 year. So we identified eight different tiers of schools. And so this is an important point, right? Like, we talked about it earlier that we're, and Carla said, we're not trying to defend a system that wasn't working. New Orleans had an unequal system before Katrina, right? But when we're talking about possible solutions, tripling the number of tiers of schools that you have and uh, further stratifying the system is not the solution, right? And that's what we see is happening here. And I also feel compelled to mention that I would love to show you student mobility data by year from 2005 to 2015, but those data were not released to me by the state, again, with multiple lawsuits. So that gets to the political side of things. So. When Carlos said that it was a matter of political will, I'm going to go a step further and say the political will is quite there, but the political will is very much about preserving this market-based system and this market-based approach with certain folks. Um, so anyway, these, these are the three main tiers of schools that are, we see it in New Orleans. And then we see that you know at the top tier school, we have 90% of the white kids enrolled in New Orleans are going to the top one tier, right? And then you can see the racial distribution across the different tiers. Um, and so when we look at what happens in these different tiers of schools, at tier one, we teach for pure knowledge, right? Um, we're not obsessed with tests. In tiers two schools, which are mostly charter schools, uh, our curriculum is kind of an emergency management system. Teachers are like a firefighters. The kids' experience are pretty narrowly focused on acquiring basic skills. Tier three schools, you're sitting down the entire time in front of the computer. It's a lot of revisiting basics. 
So, uh, and I mean, and literally in tier three schools in New Orleans, I mean, they do test prep on the computer six hours a day. I mean, there are classes, two hour block classes on test prep as not reading, not math, not certainly not visual arts, test preparation. So, so we did a study, these are quotes out of our, uh, so we did a study of, a we looked, talked to about 100 different people in New Orleans, did a 360 look across community members, educators, so uh, students, families, parents, teachers. So these quotes are all pulled from our data uh, in these conversations. But we can't, for confidentiality purposes, say who the quotes are from, but we can attribute that. No, the top school, well, so, okay. Um, almost, New Orleans is almost entirely charter schools right now. It's, it's complex because New Orleans has two different managing bodies. They have the state is the recovery school district, which is almost primarily charter schools. And then you have what was the Orleans Parish School Board, which managed, like normal school boards manage their local schools. The, they have a mix of charters and, and non-charter schools. Um, so I think the, and it's, so tracking, I'm not sure when all of the schools shifted or have, if all of them have shifted, but I think the tier one schools are either charterized or not charterized, and, and that's where the most of the uh, white students go. And then everything below that is almost entirely charter schools. So there are a variety of selection mechanisms in place. I, I don't think it's uh, tuition based. There may be like a uniform cost, but what more happens in those schools are, so the one app was designed to, um, much like common enrollment in Oakland, be this aggregating place where everybody can go online and say, I, these are my top three choices for schools. Well, when you go on the one app in New Orleans in February, what you find out is that the top tier one schools had their admissions test in November. So you're three months late to an admissions test that would have dictated whether you could get into that school or not, and you didn't even get into the, the, the test. So there's a variety of social capital um, loopholes that, that are used to keep students out. There's a, a <laughs> There are neighborhood selection practices within the common enrollment, which is supposed to be a citywide competitive model, right? So you're not supposed to be able to select by neighborhood because you're going to supposed to bus everybody from everywhere. I mean, you want to see what charter schools look like, go on the highway at 7.30 in the morning in New Orleans and you'll see just a slew of school buses going every which way. Um, they select by language preference. So if you didn't go to the kindergarten that teaches French, you can't get into the French first grade. Uh, they select by sibling preferences, so if you get one kid in, you get another. I mean, there are a lot of ways in which, and it, it's the problem of the market-based model, is that you have all of these it, it, it loopholes that, that, that open up, uh, and that's just on the selection, that's not even on the, the schools actually. So essentially what I would say is, instead of the choice model being students and families choosing schools, schools are primarily choosing students. That's what happens in the market-based model. Yeah? I hear you say that basically I know both vocation classes, you know, three PE classes, and then doing math and math and math. It depends on the school. Um, there, you know, there, it's, it's becomes very targeted. So there are some schools that do voc ed, but the, most of them do, uh, um, most, there is a huge curricular focus on tested subjects. That's what I would say for the district because that, that's what is being measured. And by the way, when you walk in through a, a charter school in New Orleans, you see on the wall Harvard, Princeton, and Yale posters, but the average ACT score in New Orleans will not get you into the community college. So you're being sold a bill of goods that's not actually within your, what you're being prepared to do in your life. Um, so we see that actually this is not the case for, uh, for all uh, places that, you know, 
Massachusetts was leading the nation in scores and has also pr protected its education system and had a public investment model. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave that later. I want to talk, well, actually, I'm going to, Steve, how are we doing on time? We, we, we need to wrap up. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, basically a summary of Ontario. So I didn't talk about Ontario, but what happened in Ontario was that, you know, the Ontario case in Canada counters this market-based argument that public systems cannot improve, right? At a fundamental level, what we're hearing now is that government bureaucracy and teacher union bureaucracy inhibit improvement in public systems, right? That's the a dominant meme that's happening. Well, in 2003, or in 1995 to 03, Mike Harris's government in, in, instituted this system that was leading towards vouchers, and that system uh, did not improve. And then it, it shifted in 2003. There was widespread teacher and public dissatisfaction. They shifted in 2003. They implemented a whole system reform model under Michael Fullan, who actually wrote the chapter for this book on Canada and that produces continuous improvement. They have key uh, steps that they follow, which you can, you can read about. But for me, it, it, the Ontario case is key because it is an idea of reversing the trend towards privatization through democracy. And that is, some, that is I think, something that needs to be fed as an idea going forward in this country. And then as a basic summary, when we look at privatization, we see declining achievement, as I showed you in the beginning. Public investment is growing achievement. Market-based systems have greater segregation, greater inequality, more push-out. And while the public investment models have greater integration, more equity, increasing attainment. And then finally, you have, we're on the cusp of a national teacher shortage here because who wants to teach in a charter school making, well, I don't know, very little money. Uh, and, and under very difficult working conditions with scripted curriculum and telling kids what to do. And it's, it's not the most appealing job at this moment uh, nationally. And, and in, in Finland, you know, they, I think it's the, like, they're, they're paying teachers on par with doctors and lawyers. It's a profession. Yeah. And they, uh, they, um, have a massive competition for entry into, into teacher preparation. So uh, I'll end there. We good? Yeah. I mean, I, do you have any? Anybody have questions? Yeah. Uh, sure. I will. Uh, the name is Global Education Reform. Uh, there's a picture of it. I mean, so one of the things about Finland is um, <laughs> the kids play until they're seven years old, and by the age of 15, they're a standard deviation ahead of us in achievement scores. So we're testing our four-year-olds, and their four-year-olds are out playing around, discovering themselves, understanding creativity and their own thought processes and owning their own developmental trajectory. And then they're sitting in classrooms with teachers who develop their trajectory uh, who are well versed in a national curric curriculum framework, which is not a scripted curriculum. So it's a it's a national framework that everybody follows, but the teacher has license within their individual classroom because they're prepared to do so to tailor their curriculum on a daily basis to the students. And then we see the performance outcomes, and that's I've already talked about the you know what happens in a test based accountability model in the United States about how the curriculum becomes diluted to <coughs> tested subjects. Yeah.
rights-based litigious special ed system. Uh, I, I will have to think about that. I, I don't know of one off the top of my head. where they don't have enough money to actually fund the paraprofessionals necessary for special education inclusion. They have a model which I call exclusion by inclusion. So they basically put special education students in the classroom and call it inclusion but without the necessary supports. So they're basically sitting there in the back of the classroom and they're not being, their needs are not being addressed. And I, I mean, I, I, mean, I talk to many parents in New Orleans who are experiencing this, among other massive violations of the IDEA Act. So, I mean, in terms of counseling all kinds of kids with special needs out of uh, certain types of schools and, um, and uh, you know, basically, yeah, not providing special education.